It's literally the Express and Star's job to bring politics to your doorstep. But sometimes it comes to ours. Labour leader Sakir Starmer took centre stage when he visited our newsroom to host an exclusive Q&A session for our readers. From community queries to national discourse, Sakir sat before an audience of the region's finest and answered as many questions as he could for around 40 minutes. Hosted by one of our most experienced writers, Mark Andrews, the session covered a wide range of topics, from the NHS and local business to education and the conflict in Gaza. Good morning, everybody. Um, a warm welcome to the Express and Star, and a very warm welcome to our special guest here, the leader of the Labour Party, Sakia Starmer. Thank you very much. It's, um, thank you all for coming in. Um, I will be short. My name's Mark Andrews. I will shortly be asking you to give me your questions. Um, we are on a very tight schedule, and we'd like to get as many questions in as possible. So what I will do is I, I will call out your name, and if you can stand up, and if you can give your question, deliver it as briefly as possibly, and then we'll give um, Sakia the opportunity to give um, a quick, uh, quick final answers, and we'll get through as many questions as we can, if that's okay. Um, okay, our first question comes from Mr. Sham Sharma, Chairman of Wolverhampton Business Forum, and he owns, owns a hospitality business in the city. Um, so just stand up, Mr. Sharma. Morning, morning. Yeah. Uh, we met before. We Once. did? Yes, we did. We did. I think uh, uh, three years uh, ago. Yes, that's right, yeah. At the moment? Yes. Yes, well, good morning. Good morning. morning. Um, my question is, what are your plan for dealing with legacy of de-industrialization and decline of city centers? Uh, bearing in mind, Labour has been in charge of Wolverhampton City Council for decades. Uh, thank you very much. And just um, before going straight to answering that, just to say thank you all for coming this morning. I really like these sessions where you basically get to ask me anything you like, and we have an open discussion, it's really good. So we will get through as many as possible, Mark, and I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, firstly, city centres, town centres obviously matter a huge amount. They're about people's identity, um, they're about where businesses grow, etc. cetera. Um, I think there's been a real problem with our high streets and our businesses. I think there are a number of reasons for that. One of them is that I think business rates don't really work anymore, if they ever did. I don't know whether this affects you, but many businesses say to me, look, business rates are a real problem. Um, we want to thrive, but business rates kick in before we've made any profit. And that means that too many businesses feel they can't operate in the city centre anymore. The high street doesn't feel like the high street it once was. So what and would that you loses. On business rates? So we want to abolish them and put in place a different um, approach, which gives a better sort of level playing field between those that are operating in bricks and mortar with a location on the high street or whatever it may be, but also um, those that are working online. The other thing that we've got to do is to work with local businesses to grow the economy wherever it is. I mean, you say Labour's been in control of certain places, and of course it has, but the government allocates the budget, as you know, and that has been cut year after year after year, and I think we're getting to the end of this point at which every single thing is being squeezed. I don't know how people in the audience feel, but so many people come up to me and say, nothing is really working in the way that I would expect it to anymore. It just seems to have declined to a point where most people, I think now, are saying we desperately need a change. But thank you very much for your question. I mean, you obviously mentioned local government financing. Would a Labour government be pledged to be um, giving more money to local government? Well, um, we're not in the business of um, making... Um, unfunded commitments but what I will say is that amongst the problems for local government um, is that all of the settlements are on a year-by-year -year basis that makes it very hard to plan makes it very hard to spend the money well and I think there's a very strong case we we'll move to longer-term settlements so it can be done but we need to grow the economy um, more than anything there's been a general decline in our economy now for 13 years. That can't go on anymore. We've got to turn that around. But that means working the with council, you. The council, whether they labor or conservative, they have a certain amount of autonomy how to use the funding. Right? So how would you make sure that the councils ha are both held accountable to how they spend the money and make sure it's mm -hmm. spent efficiently? Well, they are accountable, of course, because they have to be elected. Um, and some people in this room, um, depending on where they live, will be holding them to account by deciding whether to let them back in again or not. That's the ultimate accountability. 
I would like to see them working much more closely with central government. I think um, one of the features of the last 10 years or so is that um, everybody's tried to find points of conflict instead of trying to work together. You're seeing it today with the Home Secretary. Instead of saying, right, we've got a problem, let's pull everybody together and work together, um, politicians have got in the habit of trying to divide and blame rather than actually pull people together. And I include business in that. We should be working with business on a, on a plan for each area. OK, well, thank you very much for that question, uh, Mr Sharma. Um, our next question comes from um, Mr Tony Whitehouse, who is a um, representative of Hales Owen Pensioners Convention, and I believe he's got a question which is a question which a lot of older people are asking at the moment. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm the Secretary of the Hales Owen Branch of the Westminster Pensioners Convention. How long have you been doing that? Nine years ago. Okay, right. Um, the question, after consultation with members of the uh, region, should your party form a government next year, what would your position be with, in supporting the triple lock? Well, on the triple lock, it's been promised, and I think the government should keep to that promise, and I think I would imagine you and your members would agree to that, yes. because, um, you know, it was a very clear manifesto commitment. We'll obviously assess the situation as we come into government, but I want all pensioners to be treated properly, respectfully, and have the income that they need to get through, or, you know, the, the wherewithal to get through whatever is thrown at them. And I don't think that's the position at the moment. I don't think we're properly respecting pensioners. What, I mean, what's your general emotional feel here? Do you feel that pensioners being let down? Um, well, if, if you look at the uh, position with the OECD, yeah. the, the, British, the British pension comes about 27th, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a very poor payout. It, and what you've also got to accept, Sakia, is the one thing pensioners can't do, they can't improve their income by do doing extra work. No, I know, it's very difficult. There are other things that can be done. I mean, in the middle of last winter, I was talking to pensioners <laughs> about their energy costs, which were going through the roof, and I got absolutely implanted on my mind an 84-year-old woman, a pensioner, um, who said that she, last year, didn't get out of bed before midday because she was too scared to turn the heating on because it would cost her too much. So she was literally <laughs> staying in her bed until midday. Um, another one who said she keeps her dressing gown on all day long, again, because she was scared to turn the, the dial up on the thermostat. So there are, there are, there's the pension itself. There are other things that need to be done. Getting our energy costs down um, is, is, in the short term, which is you know, proper windfall tax on oil and gas companies making much more money than they expected to. Use that effectively to hold those prices down. But we also do need to go towards clean power, renewables fast. They're cheaper, much, much, much cheaper than oil and gas. Um, and they would give us the security, because at the moment, Putin has basically dictated what the 84-year-old pensioner I was talking to is paying on our bill. We can't be doing that. We should have control of this ourselves. So I do think there's quite a lot we can do um, together. Will you be putting a mention of the triple lock in, in, in your manifesto for the election? Well, we will. I mean, our commitment is the same as the government's at the moment in relation to the triple lock. We will draw up our manifesto so we haven't set it out yet. And obviously we need, there's at least one more financial statement before we get there. So we will set it out in full, but we're not writing our manifesto right at the moment. But look, I mean, if you could tell your members that you've made this point to me loud and clear, and I'll take it away to my team. Well, I've got the, um, the next meeting yeah. next Thursday with members. Uh, if you could pass that on, I'd be really grateful. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you may well notice we've got a lot of um, young people in the audience here. How many here. schools have we got here, or sixth form college? Is it just we, one? We, we've, or got, a... we've got four altogether. Four, OK. Yeah. We've got St Thomas. Is, <laughs> is that the, the, the first of the, uh, the sixth year or the second? So are you doing your A-levels <coughs> this or next summer? <laughs> this summer coming, the one, yeah, six months away. <laughs> Probably feels a bit close. <laughs> Okay, so we'll go to on the first one. The first one will be, um, it's L Wins. Do you have L here? You're a 17-year-old, um, sixth former. What are you studying? Uh, I'm studying maths, biology and chemistry. And what do you want to do? Uh, I want to study biomed at uni. Probably and do you know which uni you, know you're, you want to head for? Uh, Brighton, hopefully. Oh, fantastic. It's a great place. It's, yeah. a, it's a great campus down there. It's really nice. It yeah. So, um, as a school, we have a really active and democratic uh, school council. What can we encourage students to do to become more politically aware? Uh, first of all, we should encourage more students to become politically aware. I actually think young people are pretty politically aware. 
they may not align with the main political parties in the way that may have been the case years ago. But whenever I talk to younger people, um, the two things that come up over and over again are climate and this real sense that it's your lives that we're talking about when we're talking about the climate if we don't get things right. And also the other one that comes up a lot is mental health of young people, I think. So I do think they're interested. What I would say is get involved. School council's excellent. Anything like that, debating. But also, I'd say to every young person here, ask lots of questions. I think one thing that, I don't know, holds young people back sometimes is this fear of asking a question because it might betray, you know, something that other people say, oh, didn't you know that? And it's a real inhibitor, do you know what I mean? Where people think, well, I, I would quite like to ask a bit more about that, but if I ask, will it show that I don't know something that perhaps I should know? It's a big problem. Ask as many questions as possible. Um, but also, let's hear from young people, because the worst thing for you is to have people like me thinking, I know what you think, <laughs> rather than actually hearing from you. What's the most important issue for you, if you had to say, if you were asked in a quiz, maybe some of the young people here, what are the three things that matter most to you? I would say definitely mental health is one of them. Yeah. It's a huge thing at the moment. And then, like, the lack of resources and things available to us, like... <laughs> On a daily, so say, not even just to do with like mental health, but say like schools, like the funding and stuff that we have might not might not necessarily be enough to get like the full breadth of like education. And you can really feel that. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is in our state secondaries we don't have enough specialist teachers. So I was pretty shocked that if you take maths, which is an obvious um, topic that everybody needs to do, and all the rest of it, um, we haven't got enough specialist maths teachers. So we need we need to recruit six and a half thousand teachers in specific areas so that children are taught which i mean my frustration with the prime minister is he keeps saying well everybody should learn maths until they're 18. <laughs> we haven't got enough maths teachers for, for um, children and young people going up to even 16 at the moment so we've got to fix what we've got what do other young people what would what would you put top of your list of things that matter most um, definitely cost of living cost of living <laughs> Yeah. They don't want that, and you don't want. <laughs> I, I don't mean this is not a reflection. On, I'm a I'm a dad. I've got a 15 year old boy who's six foot tall now. He's not my little boy anymore, um, and a little girl who's 12. And it's great, but I do want them to be able to go, and I'm sure you do. Uh, but now to own your own home, to buy your own home, on average you have to be over 35, uh, and that's because. Um, the government is simply not building enough homes, not enough affordable homes. And um, the, there were targets for building homes, but Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, agreed to take the targets down just before Christmas last year because his backbenchers didn't like it. And that means there's going to be less homes, which means it'll be even harder. And so, you know, for those of you going away to college, and some of you will be wanting to do that, there's the prospect that you might have to go back home again afterwards. Nobody, you know, you don't want to stop you going back home if that's <laughs> what you want to do, but sort of forcing young people when they should be going out in the world, getting their own place, to continue to live at home because of the cost of living crisis is just, I mean, it's letting the next generation down, I think. Okay. We think another young person is George Bobby. Can George Bobby hear you? Hi. Hello, Hi, George. George. So my question is... Um, Given the pressure we are um, under the designation of the Shadow Minister, are you reconsidering your position whether to argue for a ceasefire in advance? I've set out my position in relation to um, a ceasefire, and just very briefly, there was obviously an awful terrorist attack on the 7th of October by Hamas, which nobody um, would support or could support with killing of men and women children and babies and the taking of 200 hostages who are still being held in tunnels in Gaza. So to say to Israel, whilst its citizens are still being held, um, you should have a ceasefire, in my view, is inconsistent with saying it's their right to try and get their hostages back. If hostages were taken from this country, uh, we would be doing everything we could to get them back and we wouldn't take kindly to somebody saying, I'm afraid we don't think you should be doing that. But then obviously Gaza itself is a humanitarian crisis. We've all seen terrible images 
and it's not new, by the way. I mean, you'll know this. It's been in crisis for a very, very long time um, with innocent civilians, children, pregnant women, um, uh, you know, caught up in this, babies in incubators in hospitals which are running out of fuel. And nobody wants to see that. And that's why I've argued for a humanitarian pause which would allow that fuel, that water, those medicines, that food to get into people who desperately, desperately need it. Now, that idea of a pause to allow aid in is supported by the US, is being talked about by wider countries, um, and I think there's a, there is a prospect that that could happen, um, and that's why I um, set out my position. I, in terms of the differences in the Labour Party, uh, look, I'm not going to pretend they're not there. They all actually come from the same place, because I think, I'd be very surprised if in this audience, when we see those images of, of innocent people struggling, dying um, in Gaza. We all want it to stop. That's a human emotion. I was hearing from an aid worker um, just two weeks ago who told me about a member of their staff who had to dig his 13-year-old niece out of the rubble and she had sadly died. I've got a 12-year-old girl. I mean, that as a, as a dad, that hits you hard. Um, but in the end, my position is not determined by what any particular member of the Labour Party may think. It's a matter of principle as to what can we do to alleviate the situation as quickly as possible in, in Gaza. And we're talking to, you know, senior politicians in America, in the Middle East, in Jordan. I spoke to the King of Jordan yesterday um, to try and increase the international pressure to bring this about. Thank you. OK. Um, just to move quickly on, can we congratulate to Henley Carver. Henley is the uh, managing director of Carver Building Supplies, which many of you know, it's a very sort of important local company. He's a well-known local businessman. Um, you've got a question for us, Mr Carver? Yeah. Good morning. Well, th thank you very much, sir, for coming to Wolverhampton. Not at all. It's good to be here. Um, first of all, a little observation about rates. Um, many of the buildings that remain empty in Wolverhampton are actually rates free because they're small shops. Ah, right. But are they, are they full or are they boarded up? You have to get out of play paying uh, any, any rates right. as long as you rent it um, out. So it, it, is a, it is a problem, and you're absolutely right, yeah. it, but it's not the only it's, No, it's not it, the only one, because there's the boarded up properties as well, no, and, and we need to be able, we need we, more power to local authority to do something about yeah, that. Yeah, and what we've noticed, um, and we're commissioning a report as a, as a group and a company to, to see, just to look at ways we could be better, better serve, Wolverhampton would better serve the people. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully it goes beyond politics. Um, regardless of someone's colour, uh, on, on politics. And the percentage of buildings above the shops are empty. Huge percentage yeah. of, 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 uh, of buildings are empty above the shops. They could be turned into flats. There's massive preser preservation orders on buildings that don't have a modern need, like the Beatles building, which is vast in the centre of the Wolverhampton. And the other thing is there's a lot of rogue investors and speculators who are buying these buildings with no real intention of developing them. The iron firmary has remained empty for 20 years. All, all I'm asking is, would, would you see that you would try to bring people together to look for other solutions? Because it, it, it isn't really working in Wolverhampton. You can't just say it's left or right wing politics. It really isn't working. Yeah. Um, firstly, let me acknowledge that um, for empty properties, etc., we do need to try and bring people in to live in the city centres and town centres, again, because that gives it vibrancy, it gives it life, and where it's done well, it can really, really work well. Um, on your wider point, which I think is really important, which is how do we bring people together, whatever they vote, this is hugely important in politics at the moment, because it goes back to something I was saying earlier on. We've probably had a decade now of... Um, politicians trying to simply drive wedges. We have these so-called wedge issues um, where, you know, particularly in my view, the government at the moment is simply trying to find um, issues to divide the country. So they just did the King's speech, for example, the day before yesterday. Uh, a remarkable occasion, by the way. It's the first time the King has actually given the King's speech for 70 years. It's a real bit of history. But that was briefed in the papers as the whole point of this exercise is to try to create traps for Starmer. Well, you shouldn't be governing by trying to set traps for somebody else. You should be bringing people together. 
Now, I've said um, we should turn our back on 13 years of decline and have a decade of national renewal, which is about taking our country forward, wherever that may be, Wolverhampton. But the reason I, just to answer your question, because I think it's so important what's at the heart of what you said, the reason I used the word national was almost to invite anybody who wants to see their Wolverhampton or their place, their city, their area progress, and most people do, to say, actually, you don't have to be tribally labour to get behind this. If you want to advance Wolverhampton or somewhere else, we can actually pull together and do this. And I think we need a reset moment in politics. I, I came into politics relatively late in life because I was a lawyer for many years. I then worked in Northern Ireland for five years um, with the police service as part of the transition in Northern Ireland, and then ran the Crown Prosecution Service with 7,000 staff. So my experience in life is that when there's a problem, if you're in business, if you're in the private sector, if you're in public service, you tend to get around the table, work out what the problem is, and then pull people together to try and fix it. In politics, there's too much of dividing on it and pretending there's only one answer. Um, so I'm very in favour of the approach that you advocate, at whatever level that may be. And I think most people, I mean, looking around the room, have real pride in the place they live and just want to see it improve and are quite prepared to play their part in that if they think it's worth doing and that everybody else is pulling in the same direction. There's a huge amount of energy in that if we can just harness it. Okay. Can we now go to um, Claire Ould, a former nursing director in the NHS, who's got a question about the health service. Claire, where were you working? So I've, I've worked all over the country. So right. I work in urgent and emergency care all over the country. Right. Uh, I work with a team called ESIS, the, the Emergency Care Intensive Support Team. So we get called in when there's some issues in different areas to go and help them and support them to improve, which is not performance management, it's about how we help people yeah. improve. So you may or may not know, my wife works in the NHS, so we have a, an evening <laughs> session on the NHS every day. She's in one of the big London hospitals. Yes. My mum my mum was a nurse, my sister was a nurse, so we've got this runs to our DNA in our family. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that that's really important. Um uh, in I I retired on Friday. Again. Oh last Friday. <laughs> yeah. Right. And again did you say again, yes. <laughs> uh so I've been working in Nottingham with older people, uh, developing the frailty service. So it's with that in mind that I ask you the question. So huge risks to our older population come from prolonged hospital stays, as you know. Our social care services are stretched to breaking point. Discharge entry. What are Labour's plans to tackle this when they win the election? Um, firstly, thank you for your question, and I, uh, you're absolutely right. It's the, you know, there's a problem with waiting lists, which is getting people in in the first place, but then there's an equal problem or different problem with trying to get people back out again because they can't be discharged. Therefore, we need better social care. Um, we definitely need better social care. M my sister's a care worker. Um, she, she was a nurse and then she transferred to working in the care sector, which is unusual because usually it's the other way around. People in the care sector come into the NHS. I think it starts with um, a much better deal for the workforce in social care. It's very fragmented. It's not well paid. I mean, ask my sister about that. It's not particularly secure and therefore it, there's, there's a very high turnover of people, I think. Um, you know, almost all the people leaving care are trying to get into the NHS. So we need um, we need better terms and conditions. We need um, the ability to progress as a care worker, so that people want to stay with it um, and um, have a proper framework around it. I would go further and say that we should have a a sector-wide sort of pay negotiation for care workers, so you can't just have each one being picked off. You do a, 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 a bigger um, sectoral pay um, for them. That then, on top of that, you then need better condition standards, etc. So we build towards this sense of a national service. Um, now you can't do it in one go. I'm not going to pretend that you know we can simply wave the magic wand, etc. But we've vitally got to start on this, and I'd, I'd start there, build up, get that retention, get that workforce in place, and build from there. Start with your staff is is normally a good um, idea. We also have to fix the NHS, though, because um, yeah, it's on it. I, I say it's on its knees. My wife says, no, it's on its face, Keir. Mm. Um, we are really up against it yeah. um, and have been for a long time yeah. now. So that has to be fixed. Yeah. 
Okay, Holly Smith, got a question? Holly. <laughs> For many working class students, the maximum loan is the only way people can afford to attend, and loans are not seen as an increase match to the cost of living, as they are dream of going to university and attending the system. From this, we see growing inequality amongst our class students. Yeah, well, I'm really glad you used the word class there, by the way, because um, I came from a working class family. My dad worked in a factory, my mum was a nurse, and we didn't have a lot of money, and I was the first in my whole family, extended family, to go to university. It was a really big deal um, for us. But that is a working class aspiration. And I was really genuinely shocked when the Prime Minister two or three weeks ago was suggesting that this wasn't an aspiration for working class people anymore to go to university. It absolutely is uh, to go to university. Um, to make that happen, we have to pe give people the confidence to go to university. My mum and dad would have been really worried about things like loans because if you don't have a lot of money coming into the family, you get very cautious about things like loans. I don't think the current loan system works well for students. I don't think it works very well for universities either. So we're looking at what an alternative to that um, would be. Now, what we can do is constrained because um, the economy is... Uh, badly damaged after the last 13 years. I think everybody knows that. We've got to be careful about what we can afford, but we need to change it. I think there's other things we need to do as well. Lots of students are paying um, exorbitant rents, um, heating bills, etc. are high. The ordinary cost of living issues are there for students as well. The weekly shop, whatever it may be, for food. We've got to um, ensure the economy actually works for everyone and get those prices down to where they should be. So that's you know, cheaper energy, cheaper food, um, a better deal on whatever the fees arrangements are. Um, and then also give people the hope that when they come out of university, there's a decent, well-paid, secure job to go to. Um, and the point you raised before, that the dream of home ownership isn't <coughs> out of reach, because it feels like it's out of reach at the moment. And what, I'm just finish on this, because I do feel strongly. Um, having your own home, hugely matters. I mean, as I say, we didn't have a lot when I was growing up, but we owned our own home. And therefore, when I was growing up as a kid, I didn't worry about the security of our house. If you're in rented accommodation, it's much, much more difficult. And young people coming out of uni um, and or any other college who can't get on the housing ladder for a long time end up paying rent. They pay more in rent than they would on a mortgage. Um, and so you get trapped in this place where you can't there's not a house to buy, but in the end you're paying more than you would on a mortgage. That's just, we're going round and round in circles with this government. We've got, we've got to crack this. Sorry, did you want to come back in? Yeah, so you know you said about um, decreasing the, um, the energy rates yeah. and stuff like that. Um, what are your key steps in the advancement of a zero carbon electricity system for the year 20? <coughs> really, really <laughs> pleased you um, asked this. At the moment, we're massively dependent on the international market, mainly oil and gas. And that means that um, if there's an international conflict, Ukraine being the obvious one that's going on at the moment, that drives the price up. We're buying off the international market and we are taken up with this. So that's why everybody's putting <coughs> much more money on their energy bills. We could and we should have done something about this a long time ago. So over 10 years ago, there was a project started under the last Labour government to insulate people's homes. It sounds simple, straightforward, um, and when it's done well, it's brilliant. So I went to Dewsbury um, up in Yorkshire um, last winter to see some of the homes that had had the insulation done. It was a freezing day. Um, the um, people who owned the home let me in, um, took me into their home. It was really warm, and I asked them what their energy bills were, and they were next to nothing. Really, um, we, so we've got to get on with projects like that. But also, um, renewables, um, wind, solar, um, hydrogen, are, uh, nuclear are the future. Um, and we've got lots of them in this country. We've got natural <coughs> resources. If we can have clean power by 2030, we can have much cheaper bills, because renewables are cheaper. We can have independence, because it's our own <coughs> market. So this is an internal UK market. 
So we're not buying off the international market, so the price doesn't have to go up if people like Putin do what they do, whoever the next Putin is, or um, heaven forbid that that conflict is still going on. Huge number of jobs for young people in renewables, um, really exciting um, jobs of the future, the new technology, and of course a contribution to net zero, which is vitally important. You're going to live with this longer than I am, so we owe it to you to get this absolutely right. I think this is a really exciting... We shouldn't... I think the Prime Minister's wrong on... Net, he's, he's actually weaponising net zero, which is, again, a big mistake, because I thought there was a consensus on this. But instead of just seeing it as a big obligation, we should see it as a, a, probably the biggest opportunity for next generation jobs. I mean, with that comes um, you know, electric vehicles, gigafactories, um, really important local jobs that are skilled, are secure, um, and are future-looking, um, rather than this sense of decline, which we've got too much of. So it's a long answer, but I feel very strongly about this. I think we've got a real opportunity, and we owe it to you to get it right. OK, we're going now to... We've got Amy Glayland, who is better known as Money Saving Amy. She offers tips to people on how to save money in these, um, in, in, in these difficult times. Amy, you must um, be very busy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, on behalf of a lot of um, people who speak with online and who are families, um, if you are elected, how will you help families with rising bills, high childcare costs, and unflexible maternity pay? Um, we got. Um, we need to do the short term and the long term. So, in the short term, we've got to keep things like energy bills down. I think the answer there is a proper windfall tax on oil and gas companies who are making more money than they expected to do. That's a short-term fix, I accept that. Um, it's a sticking plaster, it's a vital sticking plaster, um, but you can't keep doing it every year. Um, you need to couple that with how are you going to keep energy bills down in five or six or seven years. And there are other things um, like this that we need to do. One of my frustrations in politics is that um, Certainly in the last 10 years or so, we've gone for the sticking plaster only and not done the long-term fix. Same with the NHS. Every year we have a NHS winter crisis. Um, every year it gets really bad about Christmas or January. Then in about late January, there's a sticking plaster that just about gets the NHS through till about April, May. It gets a bit warmer, pressure comes off a little bit and then we go back into the next winter crisis. Same with energy, same with food. We've got to do the long-term stuff as well. Um, but on things like childcare and wraparound, breakfast clubs we want to promote at schools where um, parents can drop off their children at 8 o'clock in the morning. Really, really important for working parents. Predominantly women, not always women, but very much for women to be able to get back into the workforce um, early. And also, um, breakfast club, meaning food, etc., and wrap around. But it's got to be a combination of short-term fix, because you can't say to people, I understand you're having difficulty with your bills, it'll be all right in five years, because they're kind of saying, my problem is now, mate. <laughs> it's this week, this month. Um, good luck with you on the five It's like the NHS. We need to reform the NHS, but if we can't fix waiting lists, um, we're not going to get permission to do so. So we've got to do that. What's your top? What's the top tip that you've had to give over and over again in terms of helping people with their bills and saving money? Um, <laughs> okay, not to worry. I just wonder what comes up most. A what's what's the sort of, of thing? A lot of what I do is um, based around quite simple tips, so day-to-day -day things and getting cash back on food shopping and, um, yeah, little tips that people can do every day, like not leaving the taps running and things like that. Yeah, and... Um, I mean, uh, Try not to just sort of hammer the government all the time, but it's we had a king speech, and it almost said nothing about the cost of living. It said things. This goes back. It said things that, that, that the prime minister thinks will cause difficulties for the Labour Party. Well, fine if you want to do politics that way, but most people say do something about the cost of living. We had a prime minister speech at his conference, um, whenever it was about four weeks, five weeks ago now. And he didn't even mention the cost of living. And yet, every, wherever we go, talking to people around the country, and um, we're, I'm out and about almost every week. I'm much prefer being out and about than being in Parliament, by the way. It's much better, you know, talking to people, getting a real sense of what's driving them. This sort of, and I'd say almost everyone, everywhere, and you say, what's the thing that's really on your mind at the moment? Say, cost of living. Can I afford my bills? 
um, whether that's food or energy or petrol in the car, whatever it may be, that is the thing, and that's what we've all got to focus on. Okay, is, um, is Tony Levy here, please, a retired electrician and army veteran? Hi, Tony. Uh, my question to you is, uh, the councils have had their government grants radically cut back, resulting in some authorities uh, reducing the essential services and raising their council tax. Will your administration, if it gains control at the next general election, reinstate them to their formal levels and what level of support grants do you propose to give to local councils? Yeah, forgive me, because I mean, on the precise details of what pounds and pence, um, I can't answer <coughs> that just for a moment, because we'll do that as we get closer to the election. But the principal thing is absolutely clear. We've got to give adequate funding to our local authorities. We've got to do it in ways that work for them. Most local authorities say to me, because it's year on year on year, we can't plan properly for three years, therefore we have to take short-term decisions. They cost more money, um, and we go round and round in circles. So we need to work with them. The other thing that we do, just to reassure you on this, is we are already meeting on a regular basis. So I meet with our mayors, with our combined authority leaders, to make sure we're planning how we'll work together after the election, if we are you know, lucky enough, if we're privileged enough um, to be elected into power. But if we are elected in, our motto will be to serve, to serve, not this sense of entitlement that's flying around at the moment. We're having by-elections left, right and centre because some people thought they didn't get the peerages they deserve. I mean, honestly. Um, so it's to serve, it's to work with our local, but also to look at the financial package to see what's a secure, longer-term package that we can put in place because otherwise it's all of you that lose out because the services aren't being provided in the way that you would expect. So we've got to fix that. Just one more thing which is really important. We've got to get our economy working again. We haven't had proper growth in our economy for 13 years. That is a major problem because you can carve up the pie in different ways and say, well, that's a bit fairer. But if the pie is getting smaller and smaller because you're not growing your economy, we've got a problem. And I think in this country we've got fantastic potential. We've got great universities, got brilliant businesses, we've got innovators, we've got research, um, but we're not making the most of it. And we've got to turn that around, desperately got to turn that around. OK, I believe we've got time for one more question here. So, um, uh, so another young person here. It's Emily Brown from St Thomas More School. Is Emily here? Emily. Yeah. Um, so obviously with the recent rat crisis and uh, uh, the government scrapping uh, Building School for Future initiative, things like um, making examinations digital in the future, what would your proposal be for investments into schools? Um, firstly, I think the government's wrong to have abandoned. That was a Labour government... Um, skilling, building schools for the future program, the government scrapped it and there's a direct link between some of the schools that now got crumbling um, concrete because they were on the list to have been replaced 10, 12 years ago and now teachers and students are having to work in porter cabins or sometimes even online. So we've got to get to a more sensible way of, um, of, of doing politics. In terms of the investment, the first place I would invest is in the staff. I feel very strongly that for the basics like maths, the point I made before, you should have the right teacher in the classroom. Now, I'm not saying that those that are teaching maths at the moment aren't doing their level best, but every, you know, we, we often have this argument, you know, are we for or against private schools? I don't mind private schools, and I absolutely accept that many people save really hard to send their children to private school, um, and that is aspirational. But working class families, those that can't afford private schools, have got the same aspiration for their children. Their children have the same aspiration. It's not, you don't divide this between the two. And I want to see a situation where it doesn't matter whether you went to state school or private school. Your opportunities are the same. Your likely grades and outcomes are the same. And your career, whatever you want to do with your life, is um, equal, whichever school you went to. That will only happen if we put the investment into our public schools and people we, we're, we're saying get rid of the there's a VAT um, tax break for private school fees um, we're going to get rid of that and some people criticize us for that but that money will directly be used for the recruitment of six and a half thousand teachers into our state schools because that investment I think is so important it's a political choice I accept that 
I will not, I'm not prepared to see our state sector, our state schools held back, our children in state schools, so I'm not, you know, I'm not doing one thing and saying one thing and doing another. Um, they are both now <laughs> state secondaries, um, growing up fast. Um, but um, I passionately believe we've got to have equality here across whichever school you go to. Okay, well, thank you very much. For, thank you very much, first of all, for your coming in. I'm sorry we couldn't get any more questions in. Uh, thank you very much, Sakia, for coming no, in to thank take you these questions. For, for being here for your mm. questions. Mm. And thank you all for coming. I believe if you do want to hang around, I think Sakia will be meeting yeah, we'll meet with some of you later. So in short, this. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you very so. much indeed. Thank you for yeah. making time. Sorry to keep yeah. you waiting. <laughs> we, sh we should do more of these because you know you can read a briefing in. Parliament, um, but it's far better to actually go and talk to people about what's on their mind, um, and for you just to have the chance to ask any question you like, I think is, is I'm really in favour yeah. of it. And we'd be very glad to have you back, obviously, so we'd be very Great. glad yep. to have you back. See you next Friday. <laughs> 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 and good luck with your studies for all of you doing A-levels next year. It'll be a tense year, but it'll be, it'll be, it'll be good. <laughs>